Jock, George, Bardar, good morning everyone and a warm welcome to this webinar on the International Day of Older Persons. And it's great to have so many of you with us joining us today. Over the last 18 months, I've had the privilege of talking to many, many older people across Wales, mainly on Zoom. And today we're bringing some of that engagement, that learning, all the people's together with the data and evidence that we've been gathering to see how the I'm in again at the end of this. all the people have changed. Now it's been a very challenging 18 months for all of us and some of the things I'm going to be drawing on when I talk today will be the work we did uh, over the course of the last 18 months to listen to the voices of all the people living in care homes, their families and people working there. And last year, we produced our Care Home Voices report, which set out what people were going through and what needed to change. I'll also be drawing on our Leave No One Behind report, which set out how older people were feeling through the pandemic and the action needed to make sure that older people aren't left behind as we transition through the next stages. And finally today, I'm gonna to be drawing on our Winter Stories report, which we published today alongside our State of the Nation report. And I'd like to thank the older people who over the winter shared their experiences with us, the strategies they had to keep well, how they felt about lockdown, how they felt about missing friends and family. So I hope you're going to really enjoy today's event and we'll post your questions uh, throughout the course of the event. And later I'm going to be joined by a cross-party panel to debate the findings of the report and what should happen next. So in a moment, I'm just going to share some slides with you and start sharing uh, what we found in our State of the Nation report. So I'm going to start with um, digital inclusion. And the reason for that is that today's International Day of Older Person is about digital equity. The theme for this year is digital equity. And we all know, don't we, how much we've relied on digital technology to stay in touch with people, to find out what's happening uh, and to access services. But this shows the real challenge that's still there with older people accessing the internet. So as you can see, for people between the age of 16 to 44, nearly everyone is accessing the internet, 98%. Well, that drops dramatically so that by the age of 75 and over, only 40% of people are accessing the internet. And we know how important it's been during the pandemic to be able to shop online, to access banking and other things. But again, for people over 65, that's much less frequent. And significantly, we know that now only 23% of older people find it easy to access health services online. And we all know that because of the pressures of the pandemic, more and more of our services are moving online. But there's a challenge here to make sure that all the people aren't disadvantaged as a result. So this is one of the reasons why in the next few weeks, I'm going to be publishing guidance to health boards and local authorities to remind them of their responsibilities, both to help ensure that older people can access their services online by supporting them to learn how to get online but also making sure that if people are not digitally connected, they're not disadvantaged and can still access things in other way, by telephone, for example. So a huge amount still to do on the issue of digital inclusion for older people. I turn now to the issues of health and care and well-being. And we know, for all of us really, how much our health and well-being has been affected. But this is particularly true of older people. And that's meant that people have lost some of the physical and mental health uh, that kept them going before the pandemic. So, for example, from the evidence from Age UK, we know across the UK, 42% of people over the age of 60 now find it more difficult to walk up and down stairs, to walk short distances. And we also know from our own survey that 17% of older people said they needed mental health support in the last. 12 months and 82% of people affected by dementia 
so their symptoms have increased. So there's a significant challenge ahead for our health services, our care services, our voluntary and community organisations and our local community groups to reach out to older people and to make sure we're doing all we can to enable people to rebuild and regain their physical and mental health. And I've been working with Age Cymru, with the Welsh Council of Voluntary Action and others to put proposals forward to Welsh Government for significant investment, particularly in the voluntary and community sector, to be able to reach those people who desperately need that health support, but also desperately need support with their mental health as well. And we also found through our work that 91,000 older people in Wales are now consistently lonely. So there's not a passing loneliness. This is something that is deep rooted and long lasting. And that can be very difficult to break out of, but it also can be incredibly damaging for one's health and well-being. So it just shows the urgency of action to reach out to people who are feeling lonely. Now, many of you will know that one of my priorities as commissioner is to work to stop the abuse of older people. And we know that one in five older people experience some form of abuse. So in Wales, that's around 170,000 older people. I've been really encouraged by the work I've been doing with over 30 organisations across Wales, including the police forces, the NHS, social care, specialist advice organisations and domestic abuse organisations. And we've been doing a huge amount to raise awareness of abuse, to let older people know where to get help and support and to start getting the evidence that for too long has been missing. And just as an example, at the moment, the England and Wales Crime Survey does not collect data on older people over the age of 74 who experience domestic abuse. It's as if they're invisible. Now, because of our efforts and the efforts of other organisations, that's going to change. And by 2023, we'll begin to get evidence of all ages of older people who experience abuse. So it just shows not just the importance of the data that's there, but the importance of understanding where the gaps in data are and making sure that those are filled so that we get the evidence that's needed. Now, in the polling we did for our State of the Nation report, some of the findings I found truly shocking. And the next one is one of these, which is that only 59% of older people felt like a valued member of society since the start of the pandemic. Now, there are many reasons for this, and we might want to debate some of them later, but we know that ageist language in the media and the press can make you feel uh, that you don't count, that you're not worth. And I've also found from discussions with older people over the last 18 months, people have said they felt invisible. They said they felt that um, they weren't worth as much as other citizens. And this is surely a key area for us to challenge. We must make sure that everyone of every age feels valued. Because if you don't feel valued, you too easily get left behind. You too easily suffer from mental health problems. So moving on now to look at the services that are there for us when we need help. And here's just some of uh, the data that indicates a health service under pressure, but also the difficulty of older people accessing it. So 41%, for example, of people have difficulty accessing a convenient GP appointment. The data on dental access shows a very, very low numbers of older people getting dentist appointments uh, over the last uh, year or so. And also the, the increase, a significant increase in telephone appointments. Now, telephone appointments can work for some people, but not for everyone. If you have a hearing impairment, if you have cognitive um, difficulties, dealing with triaging over the telephone can be very difficult. So while we understand the pressures that have been on our health services in particular and the need, the need to find different ways of accessing services, we now need to make sure that significant work is undertaken to make sure that older people are not disadvantaged and that they can access the health services that they need in a way that most suits them so they get the health care when and when they need it. 
I'm going to turn now to uh, focus really on some of the contributions that older people make in our society, and particularly to start with in employment. So 35% of the Welsh workforce are now over 50. 71,000 people over the age of 65 are employment. So it's really significant, the contribution that we make uh, in the workforce as we age, but the importance of it as a key part of our economy. However, we found that unemployment has risen by 55% during the pandemic amongst people aged 50 to 64. And this is the largest relative increase of all age groups. Now, shockingly, only 35% of employers would be prepared to hire and offer training to someone over the age of 55 in a new industry. This is a clear example of ageism and age discrimination, which denies older people the opportunity to continue working, but also is a negative impact in terms of the economy. It's very clear that we're going to need older people in the workforce in order to come out of this recession and this pandemic successfully. So we must challenge age discrimination in employment, and we must make sure that we have access to training and support as we get older. Now, our voluntary groups and voluntary services depend massively on older people. And this chart shows you the percentage of, of older people who volunteer. Uh, and the blue bar, that's 2017 to 18, and the orange one is 2019 to 2020. So the first thing that strikes you is how many thousands of older people volunteer. 36% of people in 2017 to, to 18, between the ages of 65 and 74. And over 75, over a quarter of people over 75 volunteer. That's fantastic news and just shows the contribution we make as we get older. But you can see the decline. Uh, and we don't yet have the data for 20 to 21, but we're expecting to see that that would decline still further. And the reasons we know because of lockdown, uh, because of shielding, uh, because of anxiety about getting out. But we must make sure that in all the planning that's done to come through the pandemic, we enable people to safely volunteer again. Our voluntary organisations are desperate for that support. And we know the wellbeing benefits that come with volunteering. Now, some of the most heartbreaking conversations I've had with older people over the last 18 months have been with people who are caring for others, unpaid carers. And work by Carers Wales and others has shown the significant increase in the numbers of people who've begun caring for a loved one during the pandemic. 196,000 more people, 17% of whom are over the age of 65. But we've also seen the toll that that's taking. 80% of carers now providing more care and 76% who are exhausted or worn out. And that's certainly what I've heard from, from carers. I remember talking to Margaret, who's caring for her husband with dementia, who talked about how their independence at the beginning of the pandemic was taken away in a heartbeat, where that web of support that they built up uh, suddenly fell away. And much, much more needs to be done to support people who are caring, who may have been caring for many years, but also to support those who are new to caring and struggling for the first time. And because of the pressures on the NHS and social care services, a lot of that pressure is being transferred to families and friends who are sometimes just not equipped to do everything that is being asked of them. I want to touch now on the issue of, of poverty and to start really by a look back, back to 1994, because we were getting a success story about declining numbers of older people in poverty. And as you can see from that chart, it was going down and less, less older people experiencing poverty, but it's on the rise again. And this is deeply concerning. You will also see that the older people most likely to be in poverty are single women. And with, as we know, the increase in the state pension age, in all the issues about access to state pension, in the difficulties as we've seen of getting work or staying in work if you're an older person, there's a real risk here 
but poverty amongst older people increases. And part of what we need to do is to make sure that people who are entitled to benefits such as pension credit receive that benefit. Over 200 million pounds that should be in the pockets of older people in Wales is not claimed. So we need to do all we can uh, to redouble our efforts to make sure people get the benefits to which they're entitled. And we know recently, don't we, of the rises uh, in energy costs and the difficulty in the energy market and already 67,000 older people are in fuel poverty. And there's a risk that that rises if no action is taken. I want to turn now to some of the more positive findings from our work. And this is to start with around uh, intergenerational solidarity, the connections that we have across the ages that are benefiting all of us. And during the first lockdown, 24% of people reported they made new connections with different age groups in their local community. And many of those thought those relationships would continue. And that's something to build on. We know that one of the ways to tackle ageism, one of the ways to tackle stereotypes between generations is to bring people together. So as we come through this pandemic and as we're able to regain some of our normal life, we need to make sure that those opportunities to bring generations together are not lost. And one of the quotes that struck me uh, from our winter stories report uh, was from Francis. He talked about um, what it was like not seeing children around anymore. And she just said, I'm sad not to see children and ch younger people and children around. And this makes me wonder, how are they all doing? And we've all had that experience of being cut off uh, from people during lockdown. So it's so important we come together as we come hopefully out the other side. And I also want to touch on this sense of community and optimism that's there. 73% of people over the age of 65 say they have a sense of community compared to just 56% of 16 to 44 year olds. And that's a really strong finding and we need to hold on to that. So one of the pieces of work I'm doing is working with local authorities and others to develop age friendly communities, to make sure that there are no barriers to people of any age getting out and about doing things that matter to them. And I'm pleased to say more and more local authorities are now uh, joining that work. And that's given us an opportunity to build on this sense of community. And really positively, 80% of older people uh, that I surveyed said they were positive about the future. So how can we harness that, that feeling of positivity, uh, make sure that we can go forward together, meeting the challenges that we've outlined, the very real challenges that we face, the very urgent action that is needed, but also doing so with a sense of optimism and hope and building on that coming together that we've seen. So as I go forward and work with my team, we'll be wanting to build a future where older people are valued, where rights are upheld, and no one is left behind. Thank you. Jochenbach.